Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. It's the 12 noon show on a given Tuesday, election day. So exciting. And Dwayne Gubler, Dr. Dwayne, Dwayne Gubler joins us um, for a discussion of an update on, on COVID and how it's doing. He's, a, he's an epidemiologist. He's an infectious disease guy. And uh, he was running uh, and still is associated with the John A. Burns School of Medicine, I think, and the um, Singapore Duke NUS uh, School of Medicine, where he is an emeritus professor uh, in infectious diseases. How much of that was correct, Dwayne? Uh, all correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great to see you again. No kidding. Especially now, especially election day, COVID, you know, people have been thinking about that, you know, for months and um, increasingly so. And we have all this disinformation and misinformation and we don't know which, which way is up and who to believe and so forth. And I really wanted to weigh in with you um, on exactly what, you know, what is going on in terms of the, the spread of this disease and what, how it is presenting you know, on, a, on an epidemiological basis. Well, uh, as I told you in April, when we last talked, uh, uh, the virus uh, had already spread, at least in my uh, view anyway, the virus had already spread around the world. And uh, it was, uh, there was probably very little that we were going to do to really contain it. Our best option was to uh, mitigate it, uh, implement all of the um, non-pharmaceutical uh, intervention strategies that we knew, uh, social distancing, uh, uh, cough and hand hygiene, um, uh, wearing masks uh, uh, when appropriate, uh, especially indoors, uh, not uh, being in real close contact with a lot of people, uh, staying away from large crowds, uh, basically to uh, decrease the probability of transmission and uh, not overload our primary health care uh, system. And I, unfortunately, uh, nothing much has changed since then. We do have um, uh, some potential uh, antiviral drugs uh, in the pipeline and some vaccines in the pipeline, but uh, not yet really readily available for the general population. So. We're going into a um, second wave situation where we're seeing uh, dramatically increased transmission in Europe, European countries, and in uh, the, the Western part of the United States. Uh, so uh, at this point, I, I think uh, basically what we talked about in April is still uh, appropriate today. And, uh, we need to protect our vulnerable populations, that is old people like you and I, and um, people who have comorbidities, comor again, like you and I, um, people who have uh, compromised immune responses. Um, but other than that, I, I think uh, it's business as usual. The other difference is, and this relates directly to the uh, election today, is uh, the question is, do we lock down again or do we uh, continue, uh, let, let the, uh, uh, continue to open up and uh, let businesses open, uh, let uh, schools open, let universities open, let them play football, basketball, and um, try and uh, develop some sort of normalcy from the epidemic. Well, let's talk about, let's unpack some of that. You know, um, I was following, still am, um, the, uh, the plague in the 14th century uh, and how it rolled across Europe. Of course, that, that's a different disease entirely. It's bacteriological rather than a virus, but uh, it certainly had a devastating effect on Europe. And at the time they had no idea what was, what was um, you know, responsible for it or how they could slow it down. And, and what happened over time, even without that knowledge, is it sort of subsided by itself. And I think, uh, you know, Trump has, Trump was suggesting early on that it would go away. It would go away as epidemics do, I mean, or do they go away? And over time, it would, it would um, you know, subside. 
And then, of course, we heard from him about herd immunity, which is a oh, kind of a, a related theory, I suppose. Um, and the case of the plague, it, it did subside after 10 or 15 years in Europe. And then only to surface um, a couple of decades later in various different places in Europe. And since then, you know, and before, um, before uh, uh, we learned about antibiotics, um, until the end, actually, of the 19th century, um, we had it popping up here, there, and everywhere, including Hawaii. Uh, so, you know, the question, and, and, and only after we found antibiotics were we able to, you know, uh, you know, dismiss the plague, uh, or at least that plague. So question is, um, will, this, will this virus ultimately go away by itself? Uh, and, and, this, and the related question is, uh, what about that uh, together with herd immunity as the president has suggested? Yeah, well, <laughs> you uh, covered a lot of topics there too. And uh, so as you use your verbiage, uh, we need to unpack some of it. Uh, Number one, plague hasn't gone away. Uh, plague is still with us. And uh, although there's no evidence that it's still in Hawaii, uh, I visited the last plague laboratory in Hawaii when I was there in 1963, over in a place called, um, on the big island, right in the middle of the cane fields anyway. Uh, and it was there because uh, it was being maintained in the rat population there. Uh, the plague was spread around the world in, uh, by two methods. Uh, number one, by an intermediate host, the rat that uh, traveled in the ships. And when the ships uh, docked at port, the uh, rats uh, uh, went ashore like, the, uh, like humans did. But the plague is also a unique bacterium in the sense that it has a, uh, a, a mnemonic form. It gets into the lungs and can be transmitted by the respiratory droplets, uh, the same way COVID, uh, uh, the virus can. And so one of the, in the large uh, epidemics of Europe, when in the 1300s, when it killed a quarter of the population, it was transmitted both mnemonically as well as by uh, rat. Uh, that's the difference between what they call bubonic plague and mnemonic plague. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, my wake up call in this whole process was in 1994 during what uh, was perceived to be and reported to be a pneumonic plague epidemic in Surat uh, in uh, the western part of uh, Maharashtra. And uh, that uh, uh, turned out to be a more of an epidemic driven by panic and fear than it was by the disease itself, because it turns out there were only something like uh, 50 cases uh, confirmed in Surat, a city of 2 million people. But once it was uh, uh, reported as pneumonic plague, it created panic and fear and something like a quarter of the population of that city, over 500,000 people up and left the city in a period of a couple of weeks. And that created an international, a global um, uh, emergency. And it was the first time uh, the uh, global airline industry was actually shut down, not completely, but in certain parts of, of the world. And uh, so that was my wake up call as to how these epidemics in today's modern world with globalization it can actually uh, threaten global economic security. And interestingly, uh, we, my laboratory in Fort Collins at that time at CDC was the only World Health Organization laboratory left in the world at that time. Uh, the Soviet Union had uh, uh, folded and, and the other WHO plague labs were located in, in the Soviet Union. So those labs had shut down and uh, our laboratory in Fort Collins, Colorado, was the only plague lab uh, left, uh, WHO plague lab left in the world. And so we coordinated the global response to that Indian plague epidemic out of our office in uh, Fort Collins, working with the World Health Organization, of course. But uh, anyway, uh, we're not talking about plague today, but that's an interesting, uh, interesting bug that. Uh, 
has the potential to cause major a major pandemic if if it uh, was not dealt with properly. So back. Well, to I'm, I'm wondering. I'm wondering. You know. So oh, everybody assumes, even Dr. Fauci assumes, uh, and I suppose you assume that in a year's time, the likelihood is we'll have a vaccine. But that's not a certainty. Uh, and whether it's effective, may, maybe not. Maybe yes. Maybe not. I'd like your opinion on that. But even for this discussion, assuming there is no vaccine, no vaccine, and, and this thing just keeps on going, um, do we have waves of it? Um, is there a sort of built-in, you know, sine curve um, with these diseases, whether by way of, um, you know, immune response or, or just the failure of the virus over time it loses, its, it loses its vitality? Um, or, or will it just get worse and worse and worse and infect millions of people around the earth and be a scourge on, on humanity? Uh, which way does that go? Well, I hate to say it, but um, honestly, I don't know. And I don't think anyone else knows either. Uh, I say that because we don't know enough about this virus yet. We don't know whether it's going to become endemic and, and established in a human-to-human -human transmission cycle that maintains it uh, forever, like influenza. Um, but influenza has a lot of input from animal species into the, into the human cycle too. So it may well mimic uh, an influenza type of uh, epidemiology where it is maintained year after year after year in a combination of animal and human to human transmission. Uh, we don't know that yet. We don't know whether, whether uh, it will disappear like uh, SARS-1 did. It just disappeared. Uh, it was helped along by our uh, public health measures, but essentially uh, it disappeared. Uh, we know that these viruses mutate. And we know that viruses that mutate can uh, and basically, that mutation is by random drift, uh, by genetic drift. And most of the mutations that occur are deleterious, and the virus dies out. But some of those mutations actually change the virus um, fitness, which allows it to have greater transmission. It can cause more severe disease. It can uh, infect other animals. It changes its infectivity. And uh, we know that some viruses, for example, uh, the virus that I've worked on for many years, dengue, that some of those mutations can actually uh, attenuate the virus and, uh, and allows it to go underground with silent transmission uh, so that we don't detect it anymore. It, it becomes in a uh, group of viruses that cause a viral syndrome. And so it's misdiagnosed and, and not detected. So all of these options are possible with, with the uh, COV-2 virus. We just mm. don't know at this stage. You know, some people have suggested, Dwayne, that, that um, the virus um, is, interacts, it has an interdependency with climate. With, um, for example, a small example, um, it seems like um, that when the weather gets colder, um, the virus seems to infect more people more quickly. Um, but is, is, is the temperature itself a factor? Is climate a factor? I mean, we know, for example, that the virus affects climate change in the sense that it slows down economic activity around the world. And there's less fossil fuel and um, there's less, you know, business, industrial things happening. Therefore, um, you know, we have uh, less greenhouse gas. And that, and that is a way in which the virus actually affects climate change. But does climate change affect the virus? Have you thought about that? Have you read anything about that? Well, again, uh, I have to say we don't know. But uh, in this context, we need to uh, define our terms. What you're talking about is weather, not climate change. And climate change is long-term trends that... Uh, that it can affect uh, temperature and uh, greenhouse gases and so forth. Uh, a lot of the uh, climate change uh, may be anthropogenic, but a lot of it, the most of it is, uh, is basically natural cycles, uh, ocean currents and so forth that influence uh, climate change. 
weather is a different thing. Weather is seasonal, as you are well aware, and uh, it influences. Uh, it's influenced by a lot of uh, other natural and environmental uh, conditions as well. Uh, so, in terms of weather and climate, as you as you call it, uh, uh, temperature uh, obviously does affect these viruses. Uh, if you to a hot a temperature will kill these viruses. If you leave it in sunlight, in hot sunlight, it will be killed. Uh, cold weather, it seems to survive survive better from some of the environmental studies that have been done in the past uh, six or eight eight months. Uh, but whether it infects infectivity or not, we don't know. What it probably does is increases transmission during cooler weather, much like flu does, because people are indoors and they are uh, close to each other and uh, not outside where the open air will blow the viruses away. So these are environmental uh, conditions that can influence transmission. And people, rightly or wrongly, attribute it to climate change or to, to weather. So I think, yes, it's not unlikely that we will see increased transmission during the colder weather in a temperate climate. But there are more human behavioral factors uh, that are uh, driving this uh, as opposed to actual influences of, uh, of temperature. Although the cooler temperature the virus does survive better at cooler temperatures. Dwayne, can you talk for a minute about viruses as a part of the ecology of the planet? You know, I, I don't think people have been aware of thinking about this, but it seems to me that viruses are um, they're part of our world. Uh, they've they're been ubiquitous. here a long time. They're going to be here a long time, and we're always going to have to be thinking about it and dealing with them. Can you talk about that? Well, viruses are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. There are hundreds of thousands of them in the ocean surrounding Hawaii. There are uh, thousands of them in just about every uh, ecological niche that, uh, that we have. Uh, we're learning now that uh, one group of viruses that has a, a tremendous impact on human health are the flaviviruses. And uh, it's becoming more and more clear, at least this is speculation on my part right now. So, but the evidence is, is more and more suggestive that these viruses actually evolved in insects and, uh, and then jumped to humans uh, when, they, when the mosquitoes uh, took up the blood sucking habit to uh, lay, their, lay their eggs. Other viruses obviously involved in plants and they circulate in the phloem in the, in the plant uh, juices when mosquitoes or other insects, uh, homoptera, take, suck the juices from those plants, they, they're infected by the viruses. And so, so you can see how these viruses all evolved. Every species, including humans, have viruses that evolved with them. But there are mechanisms that in nature, in ecology, that allow them to jump species to, to infect other animals. So yeah, there are, we know that for example, and this is we're just the tip of the iceberg, we've identified probably over 500, probably 550,000, 500,000 viruses that infect animals that uh, are potentially, uh, potentially infect uh, humans. And out of those 500 plus, thousand uh, viruses, a um, hundred of them, a hundred of them actually infect humans. I'm sorry, I just misspoke there. They're not 500,000, they're 500 plus viruses. Uh, and a hundred of those viruses of animals we know can jump to humans and infect them. Uh, well, here's, a, here's they don't, interesting. They don't maintain, it's not an easy transmissibility. The transmission is a complex interaction between the host, the immune system of the host, uh, and the virus itself, and the then the genetics of the virus, and so uh, most of these uh, species that jump to other animals don't take; they just die out. Mm -hmm. But some of them take, and uh, like the coronavirus, uh, it actually 
found a host that uh, is uh, permissive and, and it's taken off. Mm -hmm. So um, one really interesting possibility is that is that one day in the world through modern medical science, somebody will find a, a parallel to antibiotics, call it, maybe they already have in some ways, uh, antiviral. That'll stamp out viruses everywhere. Every kind of virus will go away. One, is that possible? Uh, to what extent have we achieved that already? And, and two, this is a more interesting question, is, is there uh, a, an interdependency between viruses and other life. If I, if I destroy all the viruses in the world, every single last virus in the world, um, is that a good thing? Or will I find that we are interdependent on viruses and it would have an adverse effect on life as we know it? Uh, that's a very uh, interesting uh, question. Um, there is an interdependency. Uh, but take up your first question first. I, because there's so much diversity in these viruses, I doubt that you're going to find one uh, drug that kills all. You're, uh, I, I suspect that through genetic engineering and, and uh, modern, uh, modern technology, uh, it's not inconceivable that we will develop methods that will allow us to uh, prevent viral diseases. Uh, and I, I have no doubt that that will come sometime down the road as technology develops. But there is uh, there is an interdependency, as you as you put it. Uh, primarily, the interdependency is on the viruses and the and and the host. Uh, the viruses need the uh, the host to actually replicate themselves and propagate. Without the host, uh, they they actually take control of the host cells and use the proteins and uh, chemicals in that host cell to replicate or actually propagate. So they, there is a interdependencies there. There are uh, uh, cases where humans benefit from the presence of viruses as well. And um, but I, you know, your your question about whether if we got rid of all the viruses. Uh, could we survive or would we uh, regret it? My guess is we'd probably regret it because there are probably a lot of beneficial viruses that are circulating that uh, we don't even know about yet. And uh, so I, I think uh, the best approach here is to, to identify those bugs, those viruses and bacteria that cause problems for humans and control them and let the others uh, go about their business. <laughs> Don't mess with the ecology, right? <laughs> unless, unless you have to. <laughs> <laughs> Something about Mother Nature. <laughs> yes, exactly right. <laughs> so one last thing we we, we touched on this uh, earlier, and that is, uh, you know, where where are we in terms of a vaccine? And I know, of course, there are serious problems in in deployment, you know, in delivery systems, and and getting it out to you know the world uh, in order to avoid you know recurrence and uh, further spread of the infection but what you know what what do you see as the likely limits of a vaccine here what do you see as the timing how far can a vaccine go um, in terms of dealing with this virus it's like uh, it's we know it's not perfect I think that's been made clear some people have sworn never to take it because it has a, a risk that they they perceive as a you know something they're not that is too threatening to them, um, but you know what are the what are the boundaries of a vaccine uh, as we might be able to develop? I mean, Israel, I read yesterday, Israel is in uh, class, what is it phase three trials on a promising vaccine. Expect uh, and they, I think they're very practical about it. They expect to be able to uh, deliver it in a year, which is not certainly not over optimistic, but it may be practical, realistic. Um, but anyway, what, what do you see as the, the likely parameters, the likely boundaries of a vaccine as may be developed now? Well, there are a lot of uh, companies and individual scientists around the world that are working on a vaccine. 
and on viral antiviral drugs as well and therapeutic antibodies as well. I think uh, I'm optimistic. I think uh, we'll be seeing some products, some intervention products that we'll be able to use either in the clinic or as a prevention uh, intervention, uh, like a vaccine uh, in the next uh, year or so. Um, a lot of progress has been made and there's some, uh, some promising vaccines in phase three trials right now. And uh, what they're trying to do with this uh, warp speed program though, is, is short circuit uh, the time it takes to get a safe and efficacious vaccine into the population. And that's what worries uh, a lot of the people who, who are following this. Um, they assure us that they are not cutting corners uh, and it's possible that they're, they're not. With all of the money that's been poured into the vaccine development, um, it's allowed them to, to really short circuit the whole process. But what they're trying to do is, is develop a vaccine in less than a year that normally takes 10 years. And, and that's what worries a lot of people. Now, assuming that they do get a vaccine that uh, is immunogenic and uh, safe and uh, efficacious, and, and the last one is, is difficult because I'm not sure how we're gonna show that it's uh, efficacious without following it in the population uh, to see if it actually prevents uh, disease. The other thing that we've got to do is I haven't seen a lot of uh, work, uh, a lot of publication on what is the main endpoint that we're trying to, to achieve. Are we trying to prevent previous uh, infection, uh, subsequent infection with this coronavirus? Or are we trying to just reduce transmission? Are we trying to uh, prevent severe disease? And those are three different endpoints that uh, need to be defined when these vaccines are brought out and put into a population. Um, I, do whether or not you, you know, you can pretty much define safety over short term in phase one and phase two and phase three trials, but the long term safety is going to take several years to to determine. Um, uh, so that that's the problem. Now, the way uh, the way we get around this is uh, we don't get around it, but the way we can can help uh, help these vaccines succeed and get into the population is transparency, be open, uh, and what what uh, the uh, governments have to do is open up the whole process so that. It can be independent, independently evaluated by scientists who are not in government, not part of the program. Now, FDA and CDC, both in the United States, have programs that are uh, transparent and, and evidence-based. Uh, they're the ones that determine whether a vaccine is ready to go into a human population. Uh, FDA does that, and they have an independent uh, committee that actually these are independent experts from uh, outside uh, scientists, doctors, epidemiologists, uh, immunologists who actually look at the data and actually advise FDA whether or not make recommendation to FDA on whether or not to move ahead with the particular product, whether it's a vaccine or a drug. Then it, if they if they decide to do that, then it goes to CDC and CDC has another committee, what we call the ACIP, which uh, committee, which is also made up of outside scientists, epidemiologists, physicians, uh, who look at the data and they then make recommendations on how to use this vaccine, what age group, uh, how to administer it, et cetera. And so these are usually very transparent processes. Uh, that needs to be maintained. It's evidence-based uh, determination. If they go through that process and both, both the committees say, yes, let's go ahead, 
then I think we can be pretty sure that the vaccine or the drug is going to be safe and hopefully efficacious. Uh, again, it gets uh, the efficacy depends on what the uh, endpoint we're trying to reach. But it's a it's a complicated process, Jay. That uh, it's very difficult to to short circuit that end part of it. Once you get a vaccine that looks good uh, in the trials, then bringing it into the population is what's going to take time. And um, uh, you know, if, if unless there's full transparency, uh, I suspect there's a lot of people who are not going to buy it. Well, we haven't had full transparency over the past few years, and I'm sure as a, a person who came up through NIH and CDC uh, that, that has concerned you, um, you know, science must rule in this area and, and not politics. And, and maybe hopefully this election will clear that up and we'll have a, um, you know, a, a better connection with uh, CDC and NIH and, and, they'll, and FDA, and they'll, and they'll be able to restore some of the credibility they had not only nationally, but globally in years past. Um, do, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, if the, are we looking forward to the depoliticization of these agencies? And uh, is that what you're talking about when you're talking about transparency? That is, and uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic that we're gonna see these agencies depoliticized. Uh, the trend has been from the time I joined CDC in 1980 uh, through the present time, uh, it's become more and more politicized. And I, I suspect, you know, public health is, is political um, by nature. Um, public health agencies, uh, as I wrote in my uh, op-ed, uh, public health agencies develop very good plans to deal with uh, these kinds of uh, situations, pandemics, epidemics. But the decision to implement those plans is not a public health decision, it's a political decision made by a minister of health somewhere or someone in the health hierarchy who doesn't like to make mistakes because if he makes a mistake, he's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. Because if he implements a plan and nothing happens, or if he prevents the epidemic, then he gets crucified and be accused of wasting money. Mm -hmm. If he waits until it's too late and they have a big epidemic, then he gets crucified because uh, he waited too long and didn't uh, implement the plan. And that's what's happened with the COVID. And, you know, it, it, CDC is going to have to work very hard to earn that credibility back. I mean, they were the, the, uh, the best public health agency in the world. I think they still are. Uh, but uh, they just dropped the ball on this uh, this pandemic because yeah. they they had good plans uh, in place, and I don't know whether it was a political decision not to implement that plan uh, in a timely fashion. It should have been implemented the first of January when they, when we first heard about this virus, but it wasn't. And I don't know what decision making process was in play to make that uh, decision to not uh, implement yeah. active, proactive surveillance in ports of entry. What, 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 uh, what occurs to me is, is that we need government um, to deal with a virus like this. We need, we need American government, I have to say, because we do have the, the resources, at least theoretically, and the medical expertise, the epidemiological expertise, uh, you know, to deal with it. And we have to get government to step in. I was uh, disturbed um, er earlier this year when uh, uh, Trump said, well, this is the responsibility of the states. And if you, uh, and still today, you know, don't wear a mask and don't care about social distancing. And, and so government has abdicated, at least in this, this period of time. And so what I, what I get out of this is that, A, we're not going to have a vaccine right away. Um, and B, uh, it's not clear, you know, exactly what government is, is going to do in the period between this election and the time we get a vaccine. Because, um, you know, we have people who don't want to wear masks and they believe it's their legal right. We have people who don't care about social distancing. Um, there are a lot of people that say testing and tracing 
um, you know, is, is, it's too late for that in, in high infection communities, it's just too late. Uh, and so it all seems to be, um, you know, a, a surrender. And, and I really wonder what can be done, what can government do, what can people do? You know, and the law is troublesome because the law says, well, if he doesn't want to wear a mask, he doesn't have to in a lot of places, even though the obvious community interest is in protecting not that person, but all the people around him. Uh, they have rights too. And so I, I don't see this as getting resolved easily. Um, but query, how do you see it as getting resolved in the period between now and the time we do have a vaccine? where it will spread and spread and spread unless government takes a role, unless people are actually forced to follow, you know, safety, safety requirements. Well, yeah, again, a lot to, a lot to cover there, but let me just uh, begin by uh, first uh, addressing your first point. Uh, I agree, we need government, um, but the U.S. has a unique system, Jay, uh, uh, for example, uh, when, I, when I was at CDC, I run an international program, and, um, and I also r ran a domestic program. Um, uh, I could not go into any state and do anything in any state without the permission from that state. Um, CDC can't come into Hawaii and tell you what to do. Uh, they have to have an invitation from your health uh, director of health which actually has to come from the governor. And, and so it's what we call states' rights. Now, you may argue that in terms of public health, that shouldn't be the case. But uh, if you do it, take it away from public health and take it away from commerce, I mean, there's a lot of things, uh, uh, decisions that go into this whole process. But what we did when we were in CDC and what CDC should do is coordinate all 50 departments of health uh, if I would have been uh, been in charge on January the 1st, when we first received that message from China, I would have been on the phone to all my all 50 uh, state health uh, or health epidemiologists or state health directors says, listen, this is this. These are the situation. It's already spread in Asia. It's almost like, surely spread to the United States and to Europe and other places. We need to uh, implement active surveillance at ports of entries immediately. Uh, I wouldn't have recommended shutting down uh, the entrance, uh, but uh, that probably could have come. But basically that's where CDC didn't. CDC has a lot of influence with those state public health programs. And so with good communication, this comes back to the second, the way we deal with this is better communication. Consistent messaging, messaging that's based on good science, messaging that is is uh, uh, reasonable and and out to all segments of the community. Uh, there was no no communication at all about this. Uh, WHO drugged their feet about they wouldn't declare it an emergency of international concern. Uh, they didn't declare it a pandemic until uh, late in I in February, I guess, um, it became political almost immediately. And, and I think probably one of our biggest problems in the US uh, it, during this pandemic is the politicization of the pandemic. Yeah. And that prevented the adequate communication, prevented the, the types of um, interaction that was required between federal and state public health uh, department. But you know, uh, Trump was right. He cannot, he could not do anything unless he declared an, a national emergency, which was not uh, justified at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but where he, where he uh, failed, I think, is by not getting on the phone to Redfield and say, you know, you better get your butt in jail and get, to, get your people working with the states to, to get on top of this. Well, it sounds like all, all that considered, <clears throat> uh, we do need a, an administration uh, that will respect the science, that will rebuild the credibility of these agencies, uh, that will make decisions um, that are uh, evidence-based and will 
communicate those decisions to all of the uh, state agencies in the country, in the hopes, and to the people, and to the people, uh, in, in the hopes that uh, we can have good policy and implementation of that policy uh, to everyone in this really dangerous interim period. Yeah. Dwayne, I, I hope agree. we can, go ahead. I, I agree, we need, to, we need to get the politics out of public health. Yeah. I don't care who's sitting in the administration, you gotta get the politics, but public health should be apolitical in terms of decisions. But as we, in today's world, that's very difficult. Hopefully we can get back to that. Uh, Duane, I hope we can uh, touch base with you, circle back as this goes forward. I'm sure there'll be more really interesting and, and maybe frightening issues that come up. And I would certainly like to uh, update with you again. I'd be happy to, Jay. I, I uh, get on my stump about these things. But... <laughs> yeah, it's a very valuable discussion. Duane Gubler, Dr. Duane Gubler, epidemiologist, uh, a national, if not a global, epidemiologist in infectious diseases. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Aloha.